first of all, it's a real pleasure having this panel, though it's very painful and dark times. Uh, just want to recall for all of us here on the panel and for our viewers this evening that right from November end 2019 and December 2019, we had an extraordinary organic process of protests emerge all over the country, particularly Delhi. And uh, Jamia students, Shaheen Bagh, all became the icons of the protest. And this really rattled an overconfident, near majority, high on majority regime who sort of felt that after the abrogation of Article 370 and the mass detentions in Kashmir, they would actually push through what they were trying to get at. So on December 9th and December 11th, when they rushed through with the Citizenship Amendment Act 2019 without proper debate in Parliament, uh, uh, you know, an amendment that violated Article 14, 15, and 21 of the Constitution and the fundamentals of our Republic, they really thought <coughs> they could get away with it. But these protests that emerged all over the country, but centered around Delhi, Jamia, and Shaheen Bagh, uh, erupted and were sustained week after week, month after month. Now, what was different about these protests is that they were not the normal Jholawala protests. So I still have been a proud part of those protests, Jolawala protests, and I hope to be in the future as well. But what was really very, very special about these protests is that they came from within the community, women at the lead, youth at the lead, and they were speaking a language of assertion, a language of citizenship rights. They were claiming the tri they creatively used the tricolor to assert their place and their citizenship rights in the uh, under the Constitution. As the HM, Home Minister, had very crudely explained, the chronology behind the regime's acts was very, very clear. The, a la Assam, a la NRC, they wanted to bring in a discriminatory law, a discriminatory citizenship law, the Amendment Act, and then after that implement the National, uh, National Register of Citizens to the enumeration of the NPR. And a very insidious 2003 amendment to the NPR, uh, to the Citizenship Act rules, allowed a lower level officer, to, lowly bureaucrat, to declare somebody a doubtful citizen. So neither the community that was affected nor the protesters were confused. They were very, very clear that the protests had to endure, they had to be peaceful, they had to be democratic, and they had to continue. Now, it was in that very heady background that New Year was brought in. I mean, that was how we brought in 2020. We didn't think that it would be that heady. Uh, what happened was December 15th and January 5th were really blots in that entire process. When you saw the Delhi police, the Aligarh police, crack down on Jamia and Aligarh Muslim University first, and then, of course, on the JNU on January 5th. Uh, what, again, probably the regime did not expect is 360-plus protests in universities, IITs, IIMs, uni colleges all over the country because the young of India, in, in India did not want to see this happening to their colleagues in Jamia and Aligarh. So you saw the snowballing, you saw the pro protests sustaining, and then you, of course, had the Delhi elections. The Delhi elections came, the lead up to the Delhi elections was condemnable hate speech, condemnable hate speech of a kind that we, even in India that has gotten used to hate speech has not seen. We saw the kind of Kapil Mishra kind of hate speeches. We saw the Home Minister himself going down to parts of Delhi and actually reviling Shinebag repeatedly, reviling the different protest sites, provoking people. So that, in a sense, a kind of a bloody neck had been cast in the neighborhoods of Delhi. So on February 22nd, 23rd, when we saw the violence break out, uh, the role of insightful speech had played its part. Uh, as many of you on this panel have been actively involved in relief and rehabilitation in Northeast Delhi, have seen the kind of despair that that uh, violence has caused people. Barely had people begun to take stock of it, respond to it, that we suddenly had this COVID-19 lockdown and the pandemic lockdown, which has put us in a situation where we can't even protest on the streets. We can't even protest about what's happening. Now, what has the Delhi police under the MHA you use these three. That is what we'd really like to discuss today with the experiences that all of you have had. Uh, I've been speaking to all of you intermittently, and I've been talking to Dr. Zafrullah Khan, the uh, chairperson of the Delhi Minorities Commission, who has taken the lead in trying to talk about some of these things intermittently. 
Unfortunately, he too is disillusioned with which the Delhi government is responding. And he says minimum 850 to a maximum of, of 1900 people have been arrested in the last three weeks without following due process, without following uh, Section 41 of the CRPC, which means that the list of the accused have to be displayed at police stations. People have to be know who are arrested. So it's in this context, uh, my esteemed panelists, that we are going to have this discussion. I will not say anything more except to go uh, and learn from your perspective and expertise. I'd like to tell our viewers that we have people here. I mean, we have Prashanji with his amazing courage and experience of human rights practitioner experience in the courts and outside. We have uh, Asim Mushtaba, Af uh, Afshin Fatima, and uh, uh, Asad Af Ashraf who will tell us particularly about the Delhi context and how the Muslim community is being targeted and how it is responding. But the question that really I think we also need to address together is who will bell the cat? How will we flatten this communal curve? So if we can come out with some sort of pointers some hope when our institutions are crumbling. We all saw Prashanji's tweet of less than a week ago, not very, very reassuring. So I'll go first, if you don't mind, I'll go first to uh, Asif Mushtabaji, who's been very, very active. Uh, he was very, very part of the Shine Bagh protest. He's seen this entire trajectory. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, uh, for very beautifully and chronologically summing up the uh, the pathway of hate. So uh, two days uh, out of all these journey of from December to January, Feb, March and April, two days are very crucial for me, 13th of December and 1st of March. So at 13th of December, I was standing at Jamia when uh, there was a peaceful protest march from Jamia to the parliament and police denied this march. And I was standing there at the Jamia and thinking, what now? So when the rightful aspirations are not being heard at the floor of the court, when executive is de denying that, executive is, is too much involved in, in witch hunting, in dehumanizing and all. Uh, when legislature passes the Citizenship Amendment Act and sees one community as a threat and propagates hate. So our aspirations, the rightful aspirations are being denied at all these three organs of the state legislature, judiciary and executive. Then I was thinking what to do. The only thing that is there to come out on the street and say peacefully that, we, look, we have been denied this basic rights and look at us, hear us, hear us out. There, there is a fire in, inside us, there is an anger. And this, this, this there was the only channel uh, through which this, this thing can be put out. That was through peaceful means. So. We all tried to do this on 13th of December when police didn't allow us. So the basic, very basic question that came before us, what to do now? So then this whole culminated into Shaheen Bagh, road blockage and, and the journey that we have very beautifully summed up. On 1st of March, I was there at Shiv Vihar looking at the th hundreds of burnt houses. And then I came to know that the Muslim youths who have, who have been who have been killed, their families are being picked up under the garb that you created the violence. So at at at, at uh, uh, Changbag, I met one of the protesters. I, I met a boy, 12, 13 years old. He had a bullet on his leg. So I I said, "Ki kitne din hue goli lage hue?" He said, "Char paas din ho gaye I don't uh, remember the exact place where I saw him. So I said, "Ki tum ja ke so goli nikalwa pehle." So he said, "Ki if I go there to the hospital, they will say ki." You are the, the, the one who are writing and they will arrest me. My God. This was the kind of thing and, and I was stuck and, and for like, uh, we cried for like 10 minutes and I thought, you what to do? <clears throat> and after that violence, rather than uh, doing the relief and rehabilitation work, government came back to its original agenda of hatred. So I'm getting calls like uh, youths are being picked up. They are brutally uh, uh, roughed up at the police station and saying, Ki, tumne aisa kiya hai, tumne aisa kiya hai. And there's a whole big episode of crime branch in which like, uh, primarily Muslims are being targeted. You see, when, when this whole protest started from Shaheen Bag Jamia and it, it, it like reached to hundreds of places around the country, it was all a peaceful affair. So till the entry of these Hindu ghouls, this whole protest were very peaceful. There was no violence at all. There was no like uh, shouting, sloganering that could incite communal thing. 
the sign bag stage is a stage is one of the very biggest example of beauty and community harmony so you have people across the religion line across the community line across all sex gender and religion everything so it was all peace when the selection came home minister and and a lot of minister as a pravesh verma and beat kapil mishra and and be it a, a lot of ministers from the regime when they they they, they were involved in dehumanizing a certain sect and the, the ridiculous part was this they sunk in down their morality when they said that women are get, are allowed to sit and and the chief minister of one of the very prominent state when he says ki aurton ko bitha rahe look at the words so these words were hatredful so ab kya kare so this is the big question even yesterday when i talked to you i was you know, the only thing that comes up we should like we should name this whole thing as anger fear and hope so everyone in the community is is angry that government is not listening to the rightful aspiration everyone is angry that look we are, we are a child we are looking at you as as a guardian as a parent but you are not listening to us and we have we have they tried all the means through which we could send our our grievances to you or grief to you but you are doing nothing to address these issues then there is a fear uh, we have seen that the the way the whole shahin bagh protest was the de- the de- mean we have seen how uh, in in the riots muslims were held as culprit then we have seen the whole jamaat issue like how muslim vegetable sellers are not uh, are denied entry into the village and all things so there is a fear that tomorrow i could also be picked i could also be uh, uh, picked up by the state machinery and saying you are the one who are doing the rights so whatever goodness you have whatever good works you do doesn't matter at all so and then there is at end there is a hope that every like every dark cloud however dark always has a silver lining but how to address that silver lining how to get it back uh, prashant where should the hope come from today the courts have collapsed especially during the lockdown and it's become very very difficult for people who are being arrested on totally false concocted charges some of them under uapa etc it's become very difficult for them to apply for bail uh, in the courts and therefore though one must continue to try to do all those things in the courts but i think that the main hope still rests with civil society and with public opinion in this period unfortunately we have seen an enormous communalization enormous attempt to communalize public opinion and and uh, uh, the people through this uh, complicit media media which is totally complicit with the government's attempt to fla- uh, to uh, to fan islamophobia which is being done on a very large scale in this country but i think that still our best bet during this lockdown of course it's not possible for people to come out on the streets etc but at least we have the social media and through the social media and through the internet media we can inform the people about what's going on we can uh, try and build public opinion against it because i still believe that while a considerable section of people may have been communalized through this fake hateful news etc which is being spread but the majority of the people will still a uh, majority of even the uh, uh, non muslim community in the country would still be fairly decent and open to seeing what is happening in the manner of the uh, uh, the kind of persecution that is going on that's our best bet right now afreen do you feel similarly that being in gnu now after you were in amu earlier you feel that once the lockdown period is over of course you, i welcome your other perspective etc also on what has been happening but do you feel that there will be a rejuvenation of the students protests of the kind we saw after the attack on jamia amu and uh, gnu because the students have been bearing the brunt for so long since 2016 when gnu was under attack before that when rohit vemula's institutional murder took place i mean the universities have been under attack sustained attack by this regime 1 and regime 2 so and to expect only the student community to carry the burden is also not fair on our part 
there has to be the rest of us but anyway so uh, i think uh, there is a need uh, and it's very uh, imperative that the whole resistance that was uh, built up against uh, the government uh, has to be brought uh, back it has to be uh, uh, reignited and uh, this fight has to be fought uh this is uh, very important the whole movement uh, not just against ca and rc but the whole muslim lives matter movement the, this whole movement against the fascist uh, bjp government has to be brought back uh, is what i feel asad yeah i mean what we have seen the last couple of weeks is absolutely ridiculous i mean this government is using even a tragedy to uh to carry out its agenda of uh, which hunting muslim youths and it's uh, going after people who have been very active in public spaces we have seen multiple people uh, who are our acquaintances friends been called up for questioning at police station so you can understand that at what level can one can understand at what level can this government bow down i mean even during a pandemic when the world is fighting covid when the world is fighting coronavirus when we are all afraid of our health this government is going after muslim youths so i mean there should not be any doubt that this government will go on uh, go to any extent to fulfill its uh, larger agendas of uh, building a nation that it imagines and it's going to use every opportunity now what is happening uh, on the other side is that i see that there has been there have been a lot of lot of protests uh, happening in the country in the past 4 5 years and i'm also talking from a perspective of a journalist for the past 6 months also multiple protests have been happening but uh, there is some form of discontent between groups also i mean certain groups agree with certain groups and certain groups do not agree with certain groups which is quite natural i mean that is always going to happen uh, you cannot uh, put everyone on the same page and you cannot bring everyone together but then what is important uh, for these uh, opposing groups despite the fact that the common enemy right now was the government and the common enemy right now is uh, an establishment which is all out going uh, which is uh, going out after everyone so there has to be unity i mean unity is very important but that within that unity i mean we have to make sure that diversity is there and diversity of opinion is there now we all have to come together all those who think who think that india should be a secular dem- democratic a plural a multicultural society should come together we all have to come on that we might have our own understanding of politics we might have our own understanding of strategies but there should not be a doubt that we all have to come together respective of all of our de- all of our differences uh, all of our all of uh, uh, different interests that we might have but we have to come on one platform and we need to understand each other better we need to understand what where is the other, where is the other person's perspective coming from what is his place of ide- what is his how is he uh, identifying himself what are his lived experiences if we see a, if we see a common muslim babbling these days against everyone saying that even secular people have not stood by us i mean there is a background to it i mean they are also very frustrated they they are also for the past 70 years now muslims have also a new middle class which is very ambitious which wants to see itself at equal pedestal with others this new middle class has moved beyond the discourse of just security i mean there was a there was there was an older generation which uh, largely talked about muslim security and uh, the problem of communalization was one major problem which is still there but this new middle class new muslim middle class and new youths emerging uh, within the muslim civil society want to move beyond that notion of security and uh, physical uh, uh, physical safety they want to talk about their rights they want to talk about their upliftment they want to talk about their social upliftment they want to be economically better so we have to understand that and we have to understand their position also uh so i mean a lot of uh, th- this is something very ridiculous that i have come across uh, uh of lately people t- tagging each other communal just because the fact that we are talking about our lived ident our lived realities i mean if someone is saying that i have experienced this as a muslim that does not make this person communal he is only talking about his own experiences as a muslim so i think we need to accommodate all these differences and come together uh, for a cause which is uh, is in the interest of uh, an, of an india which was envisioned by our forefathers including maulana azad nehru sahab gandhi ji ambedkar ji everyone so that's what i think I mean I think you couldn't have put it better than that because I think that is really the need of the hour because there are cultural differences social differences perspective not differences but different perspectives 
and True. if we are not able to respect that within the wider, wider human rights movement i think it would be very very difficult to proceed i just wanted to come back a little bit to this whole question of the due process of law not being followed in the last 3 weeks prashant by the delhi police you know whether it is um, uh, article uh, section 41 of the crpc whether it is the way notices are being sent etc now i know that uh, asif mujtaba himself was in a very friendly way called to the crime branch right yes ma'am yeah so if you could recount that experience and what you saw there uh, and uh, after you told me about it i'm pretty sure that the what you witnessed there was in fact quite deliberate on the part of the officers to send you a message uh, so if you could just recount that yourself yeah so uh, all these police officials around shahin bag uh, they known to me shahin the sign shahin bag protest thing happened so i got a call from the the local sho saying ki can i can i have a word with you so when i went to the police station they said ki crime branch officials are here and they want to have a word with you related to shahin bag thing so you need to go to the lodhi road police station for questioning and all so anyway uh, what i saw was like uh, groups of people from kardampuri khajuri and all these places being brought up there and for questioning so what more to tell <laughs> it 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 was literally a heartfelt experience because uh, on the same day i had to deliver some pp kits to a group of doctors whom we promised Uh, so these PP kits are being met by the by the victims of uh, this, this uh, recent Delhi program. So I couldn't do that for the whole day, and for the coming two three days, uh, I was little stressed also uh, because uh, there, there's no and uh, there seems to be no end to this uh, violation of uh, due process and all. But even then, uh, if you say about due process. so if i could have asked them ki show me a notice they could have very well done it so if i wanted the process to be followed they could have followed it the state is on might the big question is not whether the process is followed or not the big question is in what direction the process is going i mean <laughs> how you have become the law that you have deliberately like you are picking up only one certain community that has faced all the brunt so in shahin bag protest and 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 jamia protest uh, who was there at the sufferers end we suffered it the community suffered it in the whole delhi pogrom who suffered it uh, when i went to shiv vihar and you know, I, i i actually happened to like cross shiv vihar length and breadth none of the muslim family of shiv vihar were there after the rites and none of the hindu family of shiv vihar were outside shiv vihar so there was a mass movement of one certain community so this is very obvious that this is the community that 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 was troubled with everything this is the community that was uh, loath that was repugnantly murdered killed and and bullied also i i met lots of women who were saying that they were bullied on the way by the police ki tumhe azadi chahiye ab azadi milegi kagaz nahi dikhaoge to hum to kagaz dikhane lag nahi chhodenge so deliberately they burnt all the papers in fact uh, kids lot of kids came and they uh, with their notebook burnt and they said ki inko bhi jala diya unhone so this is the anger they are having uh, they are killed they, they they are murdered and they are bullied also so yes, the question is not the process is being followed or not the question is why this particular process that leads only to the humanization of only a certain community no i i fully appreciate what you're saying i only meant is that in law you have certain checks and balances put into place by sections of the law to prevent abuse by the police and when these are not uh, uh, observed then the courts are supposed to intervene but when the courts are told that you know processes are not being followed and the courts don't intervene then the abuse goes on unchecked i'm not trying to say that the process is just at all and coming back to the point that was being made is that you know we know the names of khalid saifi we know the names of ishrat jahan we know the name of sarfura who is 3 months pregnant and in uh, jail we know the name of some of these activists but there are faceless hundreds of people prashant who are just daily wage earners who are muslims who may not be so well known who are simply being picked up after being targeted as part of a community in the delhi violence so it's literally like a 
double or a triple whammy, you know, that you're not allowed to protest, then you're subject to a pogrom and now you're being targeted. So it's literally a repeated lesson that the state is trying to teach you. Uh, and again, I'd like to recall the words of the Home Minister when he tried to say that, you know, we will use this face something technology of on 1900 people because 1900 people have been involved in the killing of these two constables. He, he put a figure to it. And that technology that he was talking about, that forensic face sitting technology, is doubted for its authenticity. Uh, and they now claim that they're going to use this uh, uh, te technology to target uh, hundreds of people. So, I mean, what, what really is the way out? Because it's huge, gross human rights abuse that is going on. And of course, hopefully, when the lockdown goes away, we will see a renewal of the protests and the people will come back on the streets. But uh, surely the abuse needs to be stopped and the people perpetrating it punished. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. You see, uh, uh, as it is when there is a very strong fascist government as we have today, we have seen that the courts, which are the supposed to be the frontline institution to prevent abuse of this kind of power that we are seeing, malafide uh, targeting of uh, one section of society, communal targeting of one section of society, making false cases against them. Then it is the judiciary. We expect the judiciary to intervene. Unfortunately, the judiciary is failing us. It was failing us even before this lockdown happened and after the lockdown, they, the judiciary seems to be under a lockdown as well in the sense that it has become virtually dysfunctional. Therefore, in these circumstances, I think, firstly, we have to raise our voices against the collapse of the judiciary. We have to speak truths to the power of the judiciary also. And we have to get uh, public opinion of uh, retired judges, uh, other uh, respected senior advocates, etc., to comment on what the on the inaction of the judiciary or the collapse of the judiciary in the face of this severe onslaught on people's rights, etc. Secondly, I think we need to activate all the international forums, international organizations, human rights organizations, other organizations across the world to uh, bring to their attention as to what is happening in this India. Uh, in, in India. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, almost a genocidal situation that we are witnessing. The kind of Islamophobia that is being fanned by uh, uh, media organizations, by the government, the kind of uh, targeting that we are seeing, uh, specific targeting, abuse of power, etc., uh, especially against one community, this needs to be brought to the attention of every international agency that we can muster, so that at least some international pressure comes to bear on this government. Simultaneously, as I said, we need to also put out the correct facts, put out the correct narrative, point out what kind of falsehoods are being pervaded, etc., through the whatever media we have uh, access to whether it's the social media or the internet media or whatever. Those are the things that I can think of which we can do at this time. What do you all feel about the role of the political opposition? That is one question I think we need to address on this panel because uh, we can't abandon that space completely. However disappointed we are in the way the opposition is either functioning, not functioning, or the media is not projecting what it's trying to do because there's also a huge media uh, blackout of what the opposition tries to do on occasion. So what about the political opposition is what I'd like to put to all of you. Uh, Afreen? Yes, so I think, uh, am I audible? For yeah. You? Yeah, you're audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, see, of course, there might be things that the political opposition is trying to do and it's not uh, being uh, brought out in the public light but then again uh, we cannot uh, forget what uh, happened uh, or what the congress has been doing uh, it is not uh, very 
supportive of the minority of the country anyway so like the uapa for that matter was brought uh, pota all this was brought in congress's time and bjp is using it uh, uh, so i am not sure if i can really uh, rely on the political opposition of the country right now the opposition has to come from the people itself the, the people who make the the, the democracy uh, and how it works and uh, that is the, that that has to be the real opposition to the majoritarianism that is going on right now in the country and uh, i just like want to go back to the first question because i could not answer it Uh, so what i feel is happening right now is just an extension to the uh, delhi pogrom that happened and uh, in particular and the anti muslim uh, bigotry of the indian state in general uh, we we see uh, the it's it's a very systemic effort to curb and to uh, muzzle the voices of uh, the organic faces and voices that came up during the whole ca movement and the way a uh, muslim community has uh, risen and shown that we are going to demand our self respect and dignity we are going to talk about our rights and uh, we are going to demand it from uh, the government it's rightfully our right and uh, we need to uh, be given uh, we we so the whole discrimination that the community has been facing is being challenged is being questioned by the community itself so it's it's a very systemic way to muzzle the voices that rose and it's a way in a way they just showing us our place that this is not your place you can, how dare you even speak up so they just trying to put this instill this fear in other activists that if you also speak up you're also going to wound up in jail so this is what they're trying to do and uh, like prashant sir said that uh, i i was going to make this point that this has to be brought into the international forums and uh, we have to take this matter internationally that this is what is happening in the largest democracy of the world this is how india is treating its minorities asad any hope from the opposition or is has it got to be only the people well i think i mean uh, as long as we are having elections we cannot lose hope from opposition politics the hope has to be there and uh, opposition also has to realize that the vote bank it has so it has now mostly comprises of uh, muslim major muslims which uh, constitute 6% so it just cannot go into that uh, and buy bjp's narrative that muslims uh, vote doesn't exist anymore and muslims vote bank has ceased to exist even if the vote bank is a negative connotation here but then i think uh, there is a need to differentiate between uh, congress and uh, there is no denying in the fact that congress has been at wrongs congress congress has committed a lot of mistakes in the past but theoretically there is a need to differentiate between congress and bjp and congress and uh, bjp and other oppositions pragmatically there might have been uh, mistakes and uh, they might have committed a lot of mistakes everyone in the opposition right now but uh, at this point of time we cannot uh, afford to completely uh, Uh, let off opposition go from our hands we have to negotiate with them we have to make them understand that see uh, this is now it, this is now how it is going to work uh, you are not just here for uh, political uh, you're not just here for an elect- for an electoral game and being in power there are principles beyond foundation of parties there are principles beyond foundation of uh, congress party samajwadi party other parties uh, everyone every party has been on a certain ideological line we have to make them understand that this is uh, if uh, bjp can work so ideologically in the country why can't you people be more ideological in your commitment to politics than bjp and uh, theek hai the, the 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 difference uh, we envision the, the difference we envision might not happen very soon i mean it might take its own time but as long as we fight this battle ideologically even the political battle in terms of electoral numbers and electoral games ideologically the, the the result is going to be very fruitful even if it take 10 years from now 15 years from now uh, if you are a- able to change this ideological atmosphere which has taken over our beautiful country uh, this is something i mean so we cannot just uh, let opposition go and say that we cannot uh, 
we don't believe in opposition and we don't uh, believe in opposition politics and it's just i mean we also uh, uh, we all have to work in tandem with each other we all have to coordinate with each other and uh, do whatever we can and uh, opposition has to be i mean congress has to be engaged with other opposition parties have to be engaged with and they have to be made accountable that see it's also your responsibility you will also be held accountable for this in history tomorrow when history will be written you will be held accountable for the fact that you were silent when things were happening with minorities in your country and uh, there are some good people in congress there are some good people in other opposition parties who you can engage with and you can always talk to so i think uh, it's important for us to negotiate and uh, talk to opposition open up uh, channels of uh, uh, negotiation which is very diverse in terms of its representation from civil society so civil society representation uh, uh, which talks to the opposition should also be diverse so that so that it has uh, uh, multiple opinions and uh, multiple layers of uh, thinking so that's what i think chasing the ideological battle i like that line as said mm-hmm. that we need to chase the ideological battle and win it rather than assuming that it's only an electoral battle that we are facing we actually are facing a huge onslaught of ideology which wants to take over the very fundamentals of indian society and state uh, and that's a tougher task do you feel fear asif uh, as a young muslim of course <laughs> but it's coming to like uh, uh, the big question at this juncture should not be a position by whom it should rather be a position to what so i'm totally convinced with what our friends uh, beautifully summed up so when we chase about whom we we we, we have seen under the garb of a political party uh, a political party has done lot of uh, bad things nefarious thing diabolical agenda as not as as summed up so at this current juncture we should be thinking about opposition to what opposition to hatred opposition to violence opposition to bigotry and all so the real opposition at this moment is the people the people who 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 are the basic essence who the people who are the dna of this democracy so these were the people who came to the streets through jah jamia shahin bag and all so we should not we should not put up the entire faith in any political system in any political party we should be putting our face in people himself uh, and when you ask uh, do i fear yes i do fear i do fear as millions of minority are fearing i do fear as we are being lynched under the garb of cow protection i do fear that i am the one whose name is enough to boycott economically so if someone is boycotting a muslim he is not asking how many family you have at home how many of family you have to take care of what is the daily wage or income you are getting so my name is enough to be lynched to be economically boycotted to be murdered to be silenced to be to be bullied to be dehumanized to be witch hunted and all so i really fear and the the the, the, the toughest part is you sit at the comfort of your home uh, and then you think that you 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 belong to one person of the community who is literate who is educated and who sees different, like Uh, who could see things and then if you were afraid at these circumstances what will happen to to the uh, the downtrodden of the community and that's like we all are numb we all are clueless you're amazingly brave i don't think you're numb or clueless you are doing wonderful work and i think the way both of you i saw you observed your work closely both asif and uh, uh, asad after the delhi pogrom and uh, it was an absolutely inspiring work you were looking at it from afar in mumbai but we are very very proud of it i don't think you're clueless at all i think the least we can do is uh, join forces join hands uh, and uh, allow us to also learn from your experiences because every generation has a lot to teach and i think you're living through far more uh, rapacious hatred than we ever lived through so maybe we have more things to hope on but you're still out there you're still fighting and you're still fighting very bravely with a smile on your faces and i think that's amazing uh asad you were saying something uh, thing to me yesterday about your worry about the muslim youth and the, what they're going through would you like to say something on that yeah 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 so i uh, of lately i have been interacting with uh, some muslim youths and trying to get Uh, a perspective on what's going on in their minds amid all this what uh, amid all the witch hunt and targeting and uh, abuses and everything so 
uh, I have come through a very disturbing trend. Personally, I find this very disturbing. I don't see uh, bravery in that. I mean, I don't want to go with that bravery notion. But uh, Muslim youths have come to the point of saturation uh, that they are now willing to go to jails. I mean, they're just going. They're just saying that if uh, going to jail uh, exposes uh, the unjust uh, practices of this uh, regime and this establishment, uh, let us go to jails. And the fear of going to jails. Uh, jail has moved out. I mean, moved out of their minds. This was not the case ten years ago. I mean, we have been active for a very long time. I mean, we used to be very scared of going to going to a jail. If someone would tell us that you will go to a jail, we might just be uh, panicked and uh, might just act uh, bizarre. So this the, now th this has changed. I mean, I've been talking to Muslim youth and they're just not worried. They're just indifferent to it. So this is something that is very, very, very. Uh, it's something that for us to think that how do we win back their confidence? How do we make Make them how we how we normalize things in their mind. They are going through a great deal of psycho uh, psychological issues issues too. So we need to address all that. And so I also want to one uh, also want want to add one more uh, point to what I've been saying. There also there have also been attempts in the civil society to in in the civil society to invisibilize Muslim issues. Yeah. I mean, uh, for strategic purpose or whatever purpose, there has there have been uh, uh, attempts to do that. I think uh, if when political parties are doing that, we can't do that. I mean, as civil society members, at as thinking uh, people of this country, as people who believe in democracy, as people who believe in constitution, we cannot afford to be strategic or strategic like political parties. Parties. I mean, political parties have their own number games, have their own strategies, have their own pragmatic uh, strategies in place. But we can't afford to do that. We have to speak truth to power. I mean, if the problem is Muslim, we have to uh, address it uh, from a Muslim lens. I mean, invisibilization of Muslim issues, um, uh, invisibilization of Muslims in public. Like, if someone comes to me in, in a beard, in a cap, uh, I mean, there is. Uh, uh, I have observed this that then. Uh, a little uh, uneasiness with uh, people who are uh, more liberal in their outlook and uh, more uh, secular in their outlook. I mean, we have to be accommodative as long as that person is not carrying a notion of superiority. Uh, what is what is our what is our problem if someone is wearing a skull cap or someone is having a beard? I mean, uh, as long as that person believes in the idea of India, as long as that person believes in this democracy, as that as long as this person believes in this constitution, the constitution allows him to do all that he's doing to have. Uh, to go to a mosque to wear a uh, to wear a skull cap to have a dahi so why do we have problems we have to be more accommodative in our approach and we have to understand that our underlining our underlying principle is the constitution and none of us i mean uh, i can be secular in my living someone else can be more uh, conservative in his li living but that does not make me superior over him or that person superior over me we are equals and the constitution uh, guarantees this equality so we have to accept all this and we have to get this over this notion of uh, invisibilizing Muslim identity in civil society too. This is something that I want to point out very specifically. Afrin, do you also feel that in the question of dress and the question of many other things, there's this feeling that uh, you have to be a certain way, act a certain way to show yourself to be liberal or secular? Yeah, I think I, I agree to what Asad uh, Bhai said. Uh, there is an invisibilization of uh, uh, Muslims in general, not just their issues, but also like, you know, people. So, uh, uh, I don't know, just, just, just the fact that a person has a dadi topi or uh, 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 has a hijab over her head, uh, they're not like people from the civil society would not take them seriously as someone, they just like, you know, uh, uh, leave them off as someone who's conservative or oppressed or I, I don't know what, but there is uh, this uh, weird uh, idea that uh, uh, people from the civil society uh, believe in or I don't know, they have this uh, reservation against or I, I don't know what, but there is this uh, weird way of, you know, just like ignoring, ignoring you just because you have a piece of cloth over your head or because you have a, a, a beard that is longer than someone else's or because you're wearing a specific cloth that might be a part of your identity. And uh, it is there. Uh, also, I'd agree to us, Asad Bhai on uh, the whole, uh, you know, psychological trauma that uh, 
Muslim youths right now are going through, specifically the activists, specifically the leaders and the faces that this the whole uh, movement, the resistance brought out. You know, people are fearing to even post something on Facebook because uh, there might be police. And then again, the whole uh, notion that as I mentioned that you know, a lot of us like you know a lot of Muslim youths uh, are like willing to even go to jails. so it 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 has to be thought out where are we leading the youths of the country today uh, where, where is uh, the whole you know muslim youths are ready to go to jail just just to bring a particular issue in highlight uh, and it's uh, what i feel is that often what happens is that you know you call a particular issue as a minority issue where uh, as it's it's a national issue the the kind of persecution that muslim muslims are facing in india the kind of uh, like prashant sir said uh, the genocide we're looking at might happen any time we don't know and uh, it's a national issue right now and it's not a minority issue and should be treated as such and uh, the people of the country have to fight this hate that is being propagated by a right wing force and we have to challenge it well that gives us a lot a lot lot to talk about and a lot to do and a lot to think about i'd uh, just love to give a chance to prashant if he would to just sum things up for us and if there's anything else that uh, asif or asad would like to say because i think we've had a very uh, important discussion i don't know whether there are any black and white answers ready to made answers because i think these answers have to come with a lot of struggle with a lot of organization a lot of overcoming of obstacle and fear but i think we have to remain hopeful uh, the amazing inspiration that the anti ca anti npr protests gave us we need to get that uh, sense of solidarity and strength back as afreen said and i'm sure it will come uh, it can't just evaporate uh, because of uh, uh, violence and the lockdown uh, so anything else that anyone of you would like to say thank you so much i just hope we can stay with the issue i hope we can get the unjust people who have been arrested and detained released uh, democratically i hope we can raise our voice for that that is what this panel was about that there are a minimum of 850 people maybe 1900 people we don't know the figure who have been wrongly picked up by the delhi police and the capital of india we are talking about in the last 3 weeks during the lockdown period unjustly detained without the scrutiny of the courts simply we believe as an act of vendetta to fill in a target that has been set so that the backbone of the anti c anti npr protests and the high level of uh, conviction shown by the muslim community should be broken and we hope that doesn't happen prashant can you share uh, sorry sorry of course as yeah, can you share course. one one example that i just Please, in the morning i received a call from one of uh, the person there at kardanpuri so uh, there was there was this mass as kardampuri from from yeah kardampuri area uh, uh, one of the areas where right happened and a lot of people were killed so i happened to meet one of the mozins there so the mozin was brutally thrust by the police and they thought he was dead so they put him in the dustbin so in front of the uh, her daughter so the, she, he has like a 7 8 years old daughter called asha so i had a word with her uh, after a month so we brought mozin back to uh, one of the clinics at shahin bag we, we got him treated so this whole orderal was described by her daughter the how in front of her who is beat her father and they put a uh, lot of things like a lot of to be her so and one of the guy who saved that little girl was picked up by the police on the charges of uh, on, on the charges of he, they incited the violence and all so i just got a call in the afternoon so from dehumanization to demarginalization to as a society to invisibilization of us so not they are not dehumanizing us anymore they are not demarginalizing marginalizing us anymore they are trying to invisibilize us from all these fears so and then uh, i would like prashant sir to say ki what to be do what to be done in this context uh, the victims are the victims are being accused and been been put to bar so what could be the way forward this happened in gujarat to prashant you know that that uh, 
people who have been active started getting persecuted and i think it's happening more intensely now what do we do prashant much that i can offer in terms of uh, additional advice i just wish to say that uh, i mean i can't even begin to imagine what the muslim community and in particular the muslim youth is going through at this point of time and i just salute the spirit of these people despite despite this terrible odds they are still standing there and they have still not taken to i mean one of the reactions could have been to take to this kind of uh, mindless violence but that has not happened and i i just wish to salute their spirit and uh, as i said all that we can do right now is to activate uh, is to build public opinion to educate uh, people as far as we can through social media mainstream media etc to activate every uh, un agency every international agency uh, which looks into these things and uh, uh, again as you say rekindle the spirit that was there during all these anti ca protests it was undoubtedly a unique movement and we need to bring that kind of spirit back uh, in this country while the lockdown is on i suggest that we use our networking abilities we use our phones we use our connections to keep rekindling and keeping alive the solidarity till this can be physically expressed uh, uh, very soon and that was why this panel was thought of as a beginning towards that i'd like to personally thank my dear friend amir who is very closely associated with the all india union of forest working people though he's not on the panel but we were talking about it for a long long time and he, we felt that this panel should happen he also made it possible and it happened and i think we just we need to keep building up these solidarities and these things and also documenting the injustices uh, asif when you get these calls when you get these cases please document them carefully uh, for whatever it's worth i think it's important to document because i think that documentation will stay us in good stead at the right time in the courts of law and there are courts of justice which are sometimes not courts of law which is the court of public opinion so i can only say thank you very very much all of you for your patience and for agreeing to do this at uh, such short notice uh we will keep doing such discussions because i think that the situation is not very good in uttar pradesh either uh, neither in uh, madhya pradesh and many parts of the country we will try and keep doing these with you and with other sets of panelists uh please just keep staying in touch with us and thank you so much for being what you are thank you